Hello, welcome to the Intermediate Talks track. And if you're just joining us, we spoke about our socket in our keynote yesterday. And that demo, if you remember, illustrated Canva, a collaborative visual design application. Canva uses our socket. And now let's hear from Sergey Silvalnikov from Canva on how to build collaborative apps at scale with our socket. Sergey, you're up. Hello everyone, here is Canva. And Canva is a design platform where you can design pretty much anything. Social media, presentations, posters, or maybe even a logo for the Spring One conference. And like in many other systems, a lot of the interactions with Canva can be represented as request response. As a user, you can type some text into a search field, and this will be a request and the list of the templates that, it, you, that you can back, get back is a response. If you click on a template, that's a request, and the updated document is the response. If you edit the heading of the design, that's a request, and the save design is the response. But the game changes completely once the second user joins the editing. You want to see the changes that other users are making immediately without explicitly requesting them. If the second user types anything into one of the fields, or maybe updates the templates completely, you want to see the effect immediately without waiting to avoid any possible conflicts. My name is Sergey. I work on the Gateway team at Canva. And some time ago, our team set off on a journey to build a platform to support real-time collaborative services at Canva at scale and to enable all of our users to collaborate freely. And but why essentially, why should you care? And maybe, Maybe you're building the next billion dollar startup with our socket. And at some point you might get a lot of user traction and you'll need to make sure that your application can withstand all of this user load, can make sure that essentially your application scales to all of these users. Or maybe you're working on already a large code base that already has a significant amount of load, something big and huge. And you want to empower your users to collaborate in real time with our socket. And in this talk today, I'll try to cover both of these cases. And hopefully uh, for you, this talk can be useful uh, if you want to apply it for these particular cases. And during this talk, I will assume that you're already familiar with the basics of our socket. And I'll focus more on the juicy details. So let's br briefly explore what type of functionality I mean when I say collaborative applications. So here are two users, Alice and Bob and they both uh, want to edit the same design in Canva together at the same time. And Alice wants to make a simple change just to add an exclamation mark. And Bob needs to see the change as soon as possible without sending a request for the change and asking for the response to avoid any possible conflicts. Or consider another situation. So Alice is giving a presentation live on Zoom and she is sharing her screen Essentially, it's what I'm doing right now. And Bob, Carol, and Dylan are all connected from their phones, and they're leaving reactions and comments. And in this case, we want our users to also be able to make these actions and uh, see their actions on the screen, on the shared screen as soon as possible. So we can even try it right now. If I start a new Canva Live session, you can join using that link uh, with a special invitation code. And uh, on your, for example, using your phone, and you'll be able to see a heart through which you can leave a reaction. And in that case, you also should be able to see that on the screen as soon as you leave any possible reactions. I'll even do it myself from a separate screen. And you should already be able to see um, various reactions that uh, people are living. And essentially, when I say collaborative in this context, I'll finish the session. Essentially, when I say collaborative in this context, uh, what I mean is that 
for users are able to see uh, the actions of other users as soon as uh, possible. Essentially, they're able to subscribe on the events and see them in real time when they're happening. And in our case, Canva, um, Canva, the complexity of designing such an application comes not only from the application domain, but also from Canva scale. Canva has more than 60 million of users and the services need to scale accordingly. And when designing collaborative applications at scale, all aspects of engineering need to be considered. And that essentially architecture, it's the application design, it's um, the overall infrastructure. And these design choices is essentially what I'm going to focus on today. And let's start by looking at the very, very, very first component, which is this very essential. It's the architecture of the application. So the WebSockets are a perfect abstraction for this use case. They provide an abstraction which is very similar to normal sockets. You send bytes in and you get bytes out. And WebSockets are a standard transport with our socket making it a perfect choice for us. And WebSockets are great. And it's relatively easy to implement the message passing for a single service. We can just set up an RSocket connection on the client, take JSON payloads, encode them as bytes, pack them into RSocket frames, which will pack them into the WebSocket frames, and we'll send them over the wire to the editing server. And that sounds pretty easy and very doable. However, in, a, in large microservice environments like Canva, there could be multiple different services that provide real-time functionality. For example, apart from editing, uh, we just saw another service uh, that's responsible for live presentations. And both services could expose an RSocket endpoint. But I think you can see that in that case, we would need at least two connections because there would be two, differently, uh, two different services that are deployed separately. And adding a third service, for example, let's say analytics, which requires setting up another connection from the browser. And just looking at that picture, I think you can see the issue right now. And the scaling challenge here is that we need to perform multiplexing of channels that belong to different backends across a single WebSocket connection. And that way, the number of connections that we have to handle should only grow with the number of users and not with the number of backends that support streaming functionality. So every time we add a new backend, we shouldn't need to add a new connection from the browser. And the most straightforward and simple way to implement this is to create uh, a WebSocket gateway. And uh, WebSocket gateway, that service can be that backend that accepts all of the RSocket connections from the users and forwards them into the appropriate uh, services on the other side. And as a gateway, the WebSocket gateway could also support all of the infrastructure functions as well, which a typical API gateway would. So for example, logging, tracing, authentication, authorization, and all of these infrastructure functions. So WebSocket gateway accepts all of the RSocket connections from uh, the user, understands which backend each message belongs to, and routes it appropriately. For example, both editing service and presentation service would send their frames into the same connection. And the WebSocket gateway would understand which RSocket channel it should send uh, the messages to. That way, every user only has a single connection. And in that case, let's just dive a bit deeper. We can see that Bob just established an RSocket connection using WebSocket as a transport to the gateway. And within that particular WebSocket connection, Bob can establish multiple channels. For example, a channel for presentation backend and the channel for the editing service. And RSocket takes care of creating and managing these channels and ensuring the order of messages within them. And what's really important and that's essentially critical for this architecture is that every single channel has its own back pressure. But what does it give us exactly and why we essentially chose our socket over any other protocol? Consider a very simple stream implementation with no back pressure at all. Most of the time, it's going to work exactly the same. Red messages flow to the editing service and green messages flow to the presentation service and everything works just fine. But it's an outage that makes the difference. 
it's never possible to avoid outages completely. It's just a question of time until the next outage occurs. And what we can do, we can restrict the blast radius to make sure that it doesn't affect all of these services. But without back pressure, there is not much we can do. If the editing service goes down and can't accept any more messages, the clients won't stop producing them. Uh, the designs will still be edited and people would still be sending messages over the connection. But because the editing service cannot accept them anymore, it can not only bring down the gateway, it can bring down the connection, it can bring down everything in between. And essentially the blast radius is the whole system. And that's not a very good situation to be in. One backend is down, the whole system is down. And the blast radius here is the whole system. And having back pressure for every single channel separately, uh, which is provided by our circuit, saves us here. If the editing service goes down, it will stop requesting messages and the clients will stop producing them. And the messages from other backends are not affected. They continue flowing through the gateway. And one backend is down, but the rest of the system is functioning normally. And that essentially means that the blast radius is scoped to one particular service and not to the whole system, which provides us with the resiliency. And back pressure wouldn't even be as critical if every single backend has its own connection. But because we have these shared resources, in particular WebSocket Gateway and the connection, it's essential, it's paramount. And from the architecture perspective, not only our socket helps us to ensure that we only have to have one connection from every single user, but we also can make sure that none of the backends can bring the whole system down. Okay, now we've looked at the overall architecture, essentially a bird's eye view. So let's zoom onto one particular application component and essentially take a look at how we build the application. And what is our circuit on the backend, especially if we're talking about our circuit Java? Essentially, it's two things. And it's the transport that defines how to send messages and how to receive our messages over the wire, essentially how to get frames from our circuit and how to send these frames. And it's the acceptor which defines how the business logic is handling the incoming uh, connections in terms of the reactive streams primitives. It's Flux, Mono, and others. And essentially, yeah, just these two things and nothing else. So let's take a look at the very, very first one, transport, and what we can do with it. And quite often, when you introduce a new piece of technology into an existing large service, or into an existing ecosystem, you can't just follow a simple greenfield approach. You need to be able to take this technology and organically fit it into an existing ecosystem. Essentially, it's a, like just another brick in a very consistently built wall. It has to all coexist together in a very nice ecosystem. And for our gateway layer, we currently use Jetty. So when we started building the WebSocket gateway, the first question was, how do we take Jetty and make it work with our socket easily? And because of how our socket Java is built, because of the R socket Java architecture, a new transport can be introduced pretty easily. So implementing a new transport is quite easy with our socket. And it's worth mentioning that probably you wouldn't have to do that. If you are not embedding our socket into an existing application, you might need you might not need that at all. Uh, there are good implementation of our circuit transport, for example, off top of Netty. However, um, in some cases, you might need to dive deeper and it's useful to understand how this works anyways. And essentially, when you're implementing a new transport, you just need to implement two methods. You can teach our circuit how to send byte buffers and how to receive byte buffers. Essentially, how to send data and how to get it back. And if we take a closer look at these exact buffers, we can notice that these byte buffers are frames. And a very similar mechanism, wrapping another connection, gives you an ability to implement an interceptor with our socket and provide a lot more visibility into the transport. And there are already quite a few interceptors. For example, um, there is a standard implementation for our socket that provides metrics with micrometer framework. 
However, again, if you're introducing our socket into an existing environment, there might already be a way of collecting metrics, the standard way, essentially the golden path. And in that case, you might need to implement your own interceptor um, to provide ultimate observability. And transport is all about frames. So if we write uh, this interceptor like this, we'll be able to intercept every single frame and use it, for example, for reporting metrics. For example, every time we get a next frame, we report next frame. And we just collect all of this information somewhere in the metric collecting system. And all you need to do for this is to write a couple of classes. One class creates a connection, and another class just delegates to an existing connection while logging or sending the, this frame, somehow recording this particular frame uh, when it's being sent or received. And for any application at scale, observability is essential. You can't live without observability. At many conferences, you often hear uh, performance, 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 but the cost of downtime is often much, much, much larger than the cost of getting a bit more resources to cover for the monitoring overhead. But luckily, our socket can easily provide you both performance and observability. And transport is a perfect place where we can write our own interceptor and track the rate of every single incoming frame. And for example, we can build an error rate graph because we have this frame, we have the error frame, and we can build that error rate graph that basically lives on top of every single dashboard. However, metrics for streaming applications, uh, when our socket is mainly used in the request channel interactions and not just request response, is not that simple. Just consider a conventional, conventional application, for example, a REST API, or just a typical request or response interaction from our socket. Every single request has a response, which is either a success or a failure. And that way you can take successes um, and divide it or take errors and divide it by the total number of requests. And you can get an error rate, this simple graph uh, that clearly shows you the health of the system, the number of errors divided by the number of time. That's pretty nice. But when we look at the streaming, in this world, uh, making sense of the metrics is much harder because the life cycle of the channels is a bit different. For example, uh, we have this unbounded number of frames, one after another, and we don't know how many next frames is going to be within a single channel. Essentially, it can be a lot, can be just one, can be just a few. And at the end of the life cycle, the channel can complete with either complete or an error. However, when we're talking about frames, we also need to track cancellations. And we need to track that separately to the error rate. And we shouldn't forget that with the request channel, we have an incoming flux, all of the data that's flowing in and all of the frames that are flowing in. And we have the outgoing flux. So essentially all of the frames that are going out. And when plotting these metrics, it's very important to distinguish them. For example, it's very important to know where the error originated. Did it originate on the server or did it originate on the client? And the error rate graphs uh, from the server and from the client can be completely different. And at some point when deploying the system, you'd need to decide what, what the final representation of errors in the system is. And we found that it's a very good approximation could be actually, yeah, the rate of error frames divided by the rate of all frames. However, we explicitly exclude keep alive frames. And that's very important to remove a lot of noise. And that's because a lot of the connections are idle. The users do not constantly edit or very often a tab can be open in the browser and you might still have that connection while not much is going on. And in that case, you would be receiving a lot of keep alive frames and just excluding them completely altogether from the metrics or from the final error rate calculation can provide you with a lot of value because it would make all of the cases where there is any disturbances a lot more visible. 
But it's also important to remember that tracking cancellations is also very useful. And again, all of these graphs or alert, any alerts that are set on these graphs need to be separate for uh, incoming data and the outgoing data. Okay, that was transport. It's already, we covered observability, we covered how we can create a new transport. And now let's take a look at the second part of our socket, the acceptor. And that's where all of your business logic lives. Essentially, when we are talking about the WebSocket gateway, it will be the proxying logic, how to proxy um, requests from the clients to the appropriate backend. And when we talk about the actual backends, it's where your business logic lives. It's how you're handling editing. It's how you're handling live presentations. So essentially, that's the logic. And our socket gives you a way to also instrument that part. It gives you a way to override the returned R socket. Essentially, you can wrap one R socket in another R socket and use delegation. And you can instrument all of the calls and all of the request modes. You can instrument request response, you can instrument request channel, and all of the others. But what kind of information can we get from that? We already have the transport data. Do we, do we even need to instrument this particular interaction at all? And yeah, we do, because the most obvious one, we can measure how long it takes to establish a channel or get a response from the server. Essentially, how long, what's the duration of this method invocation? And that's quite important. But another um, important metric, which is easy to overlook, is um, the metric that we can collect on the lifetime of the channels. And essentially, we can get this data, how long these channels can be alive for. And this can be very useful to track the situation when there are some unexpected events. For example, uh, if you see on the graph that somehow it's always stays at five minutes, but it's expected to be for much longer. Maybe there is an issue and maybe something kills your connections after five minutes. Maybe some sort of idle timeout somewhere, or maybe something else. Or alternatively, if your channels are meant to be short-lived, you can capture the cases where, for some reason, your channels stay alive for much longer. And all of this information can be collected by um, just providing a simple interceptor. But of course, observability doesn't just mean metrics. Metrics are all about aggregates. We can take a look at the dashboard. We can set up alerts for the overall health of the system system, but we also want to be able to examine individual events, essentially what happened in one particular case at that particular time. And that can be done, for example, with logging, uh, because log events can be collected in a separate system and aggregated all together, for example, using Kibana. And it's important to understand that logging every single individual frame is often not sustainable just because the rate of the frames is very high. And it's, it's just a sheer amount of data. But also, some of the events that happen with the R circuit deserve to be logged. For example, when uh, a channel can be canceled or when a channel completes with an error or with a success and when it's established for the first time, all of this information can be recorded. And that's another way, um, and that's just another interceptor can also exist. Um, just a standard solution that provides you with a lot of observability for free. However, even with simple logging, there are some caveats. For example, consider seeing that picture in your Kibana or in any other logging system. The data was collected from multiple services, but in that form, is it even that useful? Can you get a lot of information from this data? But I wouldn't be able to because it's not very useful, is it? And uh, of course, in that case, we also need a correlation ID. And ideally, um, it will be that ID uh, that's stable for the connection, not even for the channel, so that we can see all of the events that happened to one particular connection from the user and how it was propagated across different backends. And um, typically, in 
Spring MVC world or uh, with other systems that could be done with um, MDC. However, with our socket, uh, you have to propagate it potentially in some other way to make sure because you can't just rely on thread locals. And potentially you can use, for example, our socket metadata to just attach that connection ID when you receive the request for the first time and just propagate it uh, across together with the, all of the other downstream requests in our second metadata. But sometimes you need even more information. For example, if you're debugging some specific behavior or you want to understand the whole flow of the request and collect a lot of data, but we can't just log every single frame at scale. And in this case, you can use sampling and for example, enable a lot more verbose logging for a very small volume of connections or potentially using some other criteria. For example, enable it just for yourself. It's very similar to how you do um, logging with distributed tracing. However, uh, it's also very useful for long lived channels. And yeah, in that case, you would always also need to understand at the very beginning of the request in some tracing class or whatever can make a decision and include that piece of information into the RSEC metadata together with the request ID to make sure that it's propagated across all of the services. And uh, for all of our backend services and their clients, we use code generation, uh, which is based on Protobuf IDL. And essentially, we use these service definitions where Protobuf gives us an AST, the syntax tree, and we emit the code that we want to generate. And that way, uh, we also generate all of the converters that create service interfaces that are instead of untyped flux from payload, provide you with the actual fluxes of the incoming messages. But also these service definitions can generate the code on the client side for JavaScript so that um, the code on the JS side can involve the backends. So yeah, let's take a look about the client side though, the client side code, the browser. And on the back end, we had to make sure that all of the tooling fits organically. And in the same way, um, our socket JS also had to fit very well into the existing ecosystem. And in our case, on the client side, we had quite a bit of reactive programming and it was done with RxJS which is the de facto standard for streaming on the client nowadays. And it provides a large number of different operators. However, when I first encountered RxJS, I was a bit surprised because RxJS does not support back pressure. And RSocket.js comes with its own set of classes that do support back pressure. And the decision of Rx engineers totally makes sense to me. Uh, like as a user, when I'm typing on the keyboard, like clicking, in a browser on different buttons, you can't really provide back pressure to me, to the user, because RxJS mostly is with the UI. So kind of like it's not that useful, but uh, for us, it's quite useful uh, because we need to support that back pressure on the channel level. So in that place where we convert um, our circuit.js flowables into RxJS observables, we can provide this back pressure strategy, essentially how we handle back pressure in every single scenario. And the great thing that you can provide different back pressure strategies for different channels. For example, if we're talking about the analytics service, you can say, okay, that's fine for my analytics service to just stop drop, start dropping messages when we can't record them because it's just analytics. But if we're talking about editing, we have to stop user immediately. Essentially, our back pressure strategy is to interrupt the user, maybe show them um, some window, please stop editing to make sure that none of the edits are lost. And these with our socket, we can provide different strategies for different channels, even though all of these channels are routed to the same connection. And back pressure is great. When let's say the downstream backend is down, but there is always risk that the gateway itself can go down or it might get redeployed or it might be restarted because anything can happen in the cloud. Or maybe the user just closes the laptop and opens it again. And maybe the user just 
loses Wi-Fi, or maybe the CDN node gets restarted. So in that situation, the clients would need to reconnect. And reconnection is a part of the code that needs to be implemented really carefully at scale. Our SocketJS can provide very basic primitives that allow for watching the state of the connection and reconnect when needed. And that already gives us a lot. But that's not all that we need. We need to carefully consider a few things. And the very first one is exponential backoff. Because we don't really want the clients to constantly try to reconnect if something went wrong. Or otherwise, there would be a huge ton of clients constantly trying to reconnect, which can exacerbate even mild outages and bring down um, services because of this increased load. So instead, we want to just increase wait, wait times exponentially. For example, we want to try after a second, then try again after two seconds, then again after four, until you reach a certain limit. But when implementing exponential backoff, it's very critical to implement jitter. And that's because when the servers are finally up uh, after an outage, the last thing that we, we want is for a huge wave of clients to come together at the same time. And what I mean by that, uh, imagine something happened, uh, network issues or any other problems, and the client's disconnected. And now they all together try after two seconds. Then they all try together after four seconds. And then the service, yeah, connection was restored, network was restored, now everything is great, but all of the clients come together after eight seconds. And that synchronization is what we want to avoid. So we introduce some jitter, and it can be pretty easily implemented by just adding some randomness into the wait times. So that way, that way some clients will try after one second, some clients will try after three seconds, then some clients will try after seven seconds. Because of this randomness, we would avoid synchronization of events between different clients. And other than this, reconnection is pretty simple. Just it's very important to consider these two points. And when working with RSOCKJS in the browser, the very first huge pain when we started that I personally felt a lot uh, was a lack of visibility around frames. Yes, you could always find the connection manually in the network tab and inspect WebSocket frames by hand. But for a binary protocol like RSocket, it's very useful to understand what's actually going on. And it's pretty hard when you're looking at these binary frames. For example, I would highly doubt that anyone would be able to tell which RSocket frame is currently displayed on the screen. Like I for sure wouldn't be able to. So to solve this particular problem, we've built an open source uh, a Chrome extension that allows for visualization of the RSocket frames, which you can find under the RSocket organization now. And the extension intercepts the RSocket connections and displays all of the frames in this nice, useful view in a human-readable way. And I personally found it incredibly useful for onboarding new engineers, because that way, when somebody new joins the team, you can easily visualize uh, the RSocket interactions, essentially in the browser by making some actions. It's, very, it's a lot more useful to take a look at the actual payloads. And that's a very easy way to explain what RSocket actually is by explaining the frames. So yeah, that's, that was the client. Let's now take a step back to the backend and talk about load testing. Because essentially, before we can release the application to the wild, we need to perform some set of load tests. And I guess very first thing to mention is that you can't really use an existing load testing framework for our socket, um, like JMeter or any others. However, it's very, very easy to write your own. And uh, here are a few caveats. As an engineer, it's very easy to write a test that would generate a lot of load. We can just take one megabyte payloads and send them very every 100 milliseconds and test our backends. And as an engineer, it's very easy to misinterpret the actual load because for many applications that use WebSockets, the connection will mostly be idle and the messages will be very small. 
For example, if you consider a user uh, performing some actions, clicking some buttons, making some edits, they are not going to click every 100 milliseconds. They typically would be much slower. And then they might just leave the tab open and switch to some other tab and then switch back after some time. So what I'm saying is that most of the time the connections are likely to be idle and the messages can be very small. And in that case, when you're doing load testing, it's very easy to understand, aha, uh -huh, my limit is that number of connections because I'm reaching my CPU limit. But in reality, when you have a large number of idle connections, you might run out of memory first. So that's something that you need to be careful of. And once you've discovered how many concurrent connections a single instance can handle, it's very important to ensure that we enforce that limit. And we don't try to onboard more connections that we can handle. Essentially shed all of the additional load, but on the level of incoming connections, because otherwise you can run out of memory. And typically that's not expected to happen, uh, but if suddenly your load increases for some reason, we want to serve the existing users and maybe shed our additional load until we get more resources, until auto scaling kicks in to make sure that we do not lose our existing instances. And we're still able to serve at least most of the requests. So let's briefly talk about actual configuration, about configuring the instances themselves. And first of all, an application at scale would need to be configured accordingly, at least in the number of open files. Because for a typical application under load, our circuit is very performant. And it's very likely that the number of concurrent connections that can be easily supported is more than the default number on, let's say, Ubuntu or any other operating system. And the number of open files is something that needs to be monitored. And it's, it's likely that it, you'll need to increase it. But something that's, I guess, a bit less trivial is that we also want to make sure that our application doesn't have large GC pauses because they can definitely cause issues when we are processing a large number of messages that are in and uh, that are going in and out or in the case of a gateway where we don't spend a lot of resources, uh, let's say in database connections, but essentially we just put bytes from one place in the network to the other. We don't really want to just stop processing them all because they would build up quite quickly in a queue. And in that case, we can use a concurrent GC. And there are two options practically right now. We can use either ZGC or Shenandoah GC. And in that case, uh, we use ZGC in some places. But in that case, we went for Shenandoah GC uh, because it allows us to keep more memory. Essentially, it's more memory friendly because of a number of optimizations um, related to compressed pointers. Shenandoah GC is able to keep the overall memory under control. And as you remember, every single incoming connection requires some memory. So we have to care about it and make sure that we don't run out of memory is that easily. OK, I hope it's clearer right now how we can build an application and make sure that it's quite resilient to any possible issues. And it's designed for scale. Now let's dive into the infrastructure concerns. And I guess the very first and very crucial part of any reliability strategy of an infrastructure is load balancing. So here's our architecture. Again, the same bird's eye view. We have users that are connecting to the WebSocket gateway, and WebSocket gateway is connecting to the downstream backends. And on this diagram, you can see the connections of two types connections of type one and connections of type two. And here is a difference. The connections of type one essentially represent users. We have as many of these connections as we have users because every single user represents an identity. And every single connection has, might have multiple R circuit channels within, inside. And the number of connections of type two can be much lower than that. We don't have to have as many connections as we have users because 
With RSocket, we can create as many channels as we want with the RSocket. And all of these channels can be created within a single connection. So even a single connection of type two can be enough. And that's another important role that the WebSocket gateway could be performing. It takes that responsibility of handling a large number of connections. Because as we saw, it's not something that, that trivial. You have to have a lot of memory. You have to make sure that your server is configured accordingly. And load balancing these connections of type one is very easy. We have a load balancer in front of the gateways. And every time a new connection comes, which is one of the gateways, and send that connection to that, that instance. However, when we talk about load balancing channels across the connections, essentially in the case of number two, it's a bit more challenging. And our first idea was to let's just use load balancers in the same way. There could be multiple targets behind a single load balancer, and we could just choose one. However, it doesn't quite work as well as expected as we quickly discovered. Consider a situation when the load increases and essentially the scaling load crosses some threshold. It's time to scale up. It's time to add one more instance. Okay, the new backend has started, but it doesn't receive any load at all. Why is that? And the reason is that WebSocket Gateway has already established enough connections of type two. And enough is enough. It can just create more channels within those connections. Even though more users have joined, there is just no need for a new connection. And moreover, we don't really know that the new backend behind the load balancer started. So in that case, for streaming and channels, it doesn't quite work because we would continue overloading all the existing backends. So instead, it can be resolved by introducing uh, a way of connecting from the WebSocket gateway to the services directly. So essentially, gateways need to connect to the backends directly. And this can be solved by introducing a service registry that can store the addresses of every single backend. That way, when a new backend starts up, it immediately registers itself in the service registry. And that way, every single instance of gateway listens on the updates. And once a new backend comes, it updates uh, its address and it's able now to connect to the backend directly. But what's important now, we need to load balance on the application level. And that's actually a huge benefit for us because now we can appropriately shift traffic based on the number of channels. And here, it's also important to remember that a simple algorithm like round robin doesn't quite work in that case. For example, consider that situation where we have backends one and two that's been around for a while. They've been running for a while. They've accumulated quite a bit of load and we have a number of connections established to each of them. 5,000 connections to, oh, sorry, like channels to backend one, 5,000 channels to backend two, and just one channel to the backend three. And if we continue around Robin, because of these channels are long lived, they are not going anywhere. And draw Robin will continue sending a significant portion of the traffic to the already loaded backends. So that doesn't quite work as well. And one alternative, let's use the least loaded algorithm. That way, we would just choose the server with the least number of open channels. And remember, the number of connections is very small. We only care about the number of channels. So yeah, we just choose the one connection with the least number of channels. And easy, the problem is solved, right? However, in this case, another problem would be that immediately we would start sending all of the new users to this backend. So it's once it started, um, we would just start with a huge load without any warm up, which can potentially be quite dangerous. Just sending a lot of traffic um, to a newly started service. It can easily overload it. And let's discuss how this can be solved. And in a nutshell, a load balancer can be implemented as a simple state machine. Every time a new service is added to the service registry, it starts in the connecting state. Now, once we've connecting, connected, it becomes healthy. 
from healthy, it might at some point become unhealthy for some reason. For example, if the connection broke or any other issue, then after some time out, it can go back to connecting, then again to healthy. And at the end, when it's finally been completely discarded, it was removed from the service registry, we can just dispose the channel, that state. So essentially that's a state that travels between different states. And in that case, our job is to just take a look at all of the healthy channels, take a look at the number of channels open through everyone, and sort of take a look at each socket in its healthy state, take a look at the number of channels open through each socket, and just choose one, the one with the minimum number of channels. But yeah, as we discussed, that can potentially be a bit of a problem because we won't have enough time for the new service to warm up. So instead, let's take a look at this parameter availability. And availability is defined for every single R circuit. And essentially that's typically a number from zero to one. So now what if we gradually increase availability time from zero to one during the warm up period? So if you just was just created, that's zero. After let's say five seconds, it's 0 0.1. After 10 seconds, it's 0 0.2. And it goes all the way until one during the warm up period. And now when we are trying to find the appropriate socket to open the new channel, we can just divide the number of active channels by its availability. That way, let's say if we just open five channels, um, and availability is 0 0.1, it would um, account, it would become 50 in the final calculations. And that way we can ensure a small, a very smooth warm up of the newly started socket from the time it became healthy until it's ready to serve the connections in the same way as any other service. Essentially, we will implement a very nice warm up just using a few primitives in that case. And of course, another crucial part for the instances so that we can load balance across them is to scale up under the load. And as we already discussed, it's not just the CPU that we need to take a look at. It's very often the load to the service is determined, the limit is determined by the number of connections and not just the CPU. That means that the primary order scaling policy cannot just, can, instead of being the CPU policy, it can be the number of connection policy. That way, when the average number of connections crosses a certain threshold, we can increase the number of instances, for example, the number of gateways. However, because we know that um, not just the number of connections, we still need to have a secondary policy for CPU. But it's very important to remember that um, most of the connections are idle, so we need to have this protection to make sure that even though the CPU might be low, because our circuit is very performant, a large number of connections can cause issues. So we want to scale up uh, appropriately if any of these thresholds is crossed. But again, no code stays the same forever. And deploying often, deploying at least daily, is practically a requirement for any modern software at scale. For example, we can deploy maybe once a day, maybe even more often. And redeploying a service that maintains a large number of connections can be a significant challenge. And why is that? What is redeployment? Essentially, what redeployment does, it takes a fleet of machines of the old running the old version, and it deploys a fleet of machines running the new version. And doing that very sharply, like shifting traffic immediately, can result in a huge spike in latency. And that's because the very initial process of establishing the very first connection is typically the most expensive operation, especially considering that most of the connections are idle. So that way, shifting all of the connections from the old fleet to the new fleet in a very short period of time can cause a spike in latency. And we still need to be able to survive that spike in latency. 
For example, consider a situation where network disappears for some time or there is any other global issue. In that case, all of the clients would have to reconnect. But normally, during normal redeployments, we want to avoid the situation completely. And a typical way to handle that with the request response applications is to use the registration delay. And that's kind of like a standard concept with load balancers, where during some delay, we just give some time to the old requests to complete, and we'll start sending all of the new requests to the new fleet, while the old fleet during that delay won't be receiving any requests. However, request channel type of interactions creates a connection with the WebSocket gateway. Does it complete? It might stay alive for long, and we want them to stay alive for long. So in that case, the registration delay is not really effective. And that can be an issue for many load balancers. And we are on AWS, and at least on AWS, it can be quite tricky. And in that case, you have to make sure that you have a way to subscribe on the deregistration events. And uh, in the case of AWS, it's listening to the events. It's making sure that um, this data is routed to somewhere, which can notify the actual application later to make sure that the application itself can kill all of the connections one by one. In that case, uh, the application can gradually, once it's known that it's being deregistered, it can start killing connections, asking the clients to reconnect slowly over some period of time to make sure that the traffic is shifted very, very smoothly from the old fleet to the new fleet. So that way, during the delay, we can enjoy this beautiful graph where the connections are just shifted from the old version to the new version. And if there were no these smooth shifts, we would see huge latency spikes. But because it's done very gradually, none of the users can notice any deploys at all. And in conclusion, our socket is an amazing building block for creating collaborative applications at scale. However, the change of paradigm from request response applications to streaming applications can present a number of challenges, especially when it's deployed at scale. And building such services is a hard task. It's hard, but it's absolutely possible. And it greatly improves user experience. So today I went through a set of challenges that we faced building collaborative applications with our socket and deploying them at scale. And all, essentially all of the solutions that we came up with. And um, I hope that this information was useful to you. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you. I hope you'll agree with this uh, with me on this one. Sergey's presentation was absolutely fabulous. You can see why he's such an influential part of the R Socket community. Here's a reminder: if you have any questions for Sergey, he'll be available on Zoom right now. A link to that Zoom is in the Slack channel for this talk. The Q and A can continue on Slack for some more time. <laughs>